thank you so much for joining us here today on our talk about American um, historically black uh, colleges and universities. Um, I'm glad to see so many people here and we have a really good program for you tonight. My name is Sydney Smith. I am the Assistant Cultural Affairs Officer at the U.S. Embassy here in London. Um, and we're trying to do some of these virtual programs to replicate what we can't do right now um, because of COVID. So again, I'm really happy uh, to see you guys here. Um, historically, Black colleges and universities have a long and storied history in America, especially in regards to educating and shaping some of our nation's greatest leaders and thinkers, like Dr. Martin Luther King, Langston Hughes, Toni Morrison, and of course, our first female president, a uh, proud graduate of Howard University. Um, personally, I don't think I would be sitting here if not for HBCUs. Uh, my grandfather was born in rural Virginia in 1916. Um, he and his family were watermen, which is a very Virginia way of saying fishermen. Um, and he, because of the time he was born, most, or, most higher education and most education writ large was still segregated. Uh, he had planned to go to Hampton University and HBCU in Virginia, closer to home. Uh, that didn't work out because of <clears throat> lack of spaces there. There were so many people who wanted to learn and just not enough um, space to accommodate them. Um, and he was part of the sort of great migration that left from Virginia up the Eastern seaboard. He went to Philadelphia where he enrolled in Lincoln College, which is another HBCU. His studies there were interrupted by World War II. Um, but when he came back, education was still something that was deeply important to him. So even though he was working, he had two children, um, he continued his education um, at St. John's University, which is another HBCU in Philadelphia, uh, and got his degree um, as a working adult. So that kind of set the tone for the trajectory of my family. Um, and I certainly don't think um, our story would be the same if not for those opportunities that he was provided um, by studying at HBCUs. So I also wanna introduce um, the program, we have someone who's going to speak to us, a historian, about the historical impact and import of HBCUs. And we also have a number of administrative um, admissions officers, excuse me, who can talk to you about the application process, how to apply, um, and what are the values and resources that you get from going to a historically Black college or university. So the first person in our panel tonight is Dr. Barry Lee. He is both a graduate and faculty member of Morehouse College. He received his PhD in American history from Georgia State University. And he's spoken widely to international audiences, including on State Department programming in Nigeria. He has specialized in African-American history and culture, um, as well as the culture and history of the African diaspora and social activism. So without further ado, um, I will, uh, send you over to Dr. Lee. I will say just to note, um, if you have any questions, we're going to save those for the end. So just go ahead and plug those into the question and answer uh, box that you should see up on your screen. Um, so thank you very much. And without further ado, um, Professor Lee. Thank you, Sydney, and, and welcome everyone. Uh, thank you to the uh, U.S. State Department and Embassy in London and to all the Education USA people and the Fulbright Fulbright program, uh, as well as uh, representatives here from HBCU, Spelman College, Claflin University, and Delaware State University, uh, and also to the students and others who are a part of this, this webinar about HBCUs. And so I'm going to give a historical overview of HBCUs, and by no means is this to be considered anything uh, as comprehensive, but I think I'm gonna to try to make, hit the highlights, the high points of, of HBCUs. And so on, my, on the next slide, uh, the, the question I think is a logical starting point is what is a historically black college and university? And if you, on our next slide, what you will see is a picture of a roughly 30 or 40 students of HBCUs who were part of a conference held by the White House under the Obama administration. And they had this uh, uh, called the White House Initiative on HBCUs. And so when we talk about HBCUs, we talk about roughly a little over 100 colleges, universities, and professional schools that were created starting in the 19th century to serve uh, Black Americans. And officially, the White House defines 
HBCUs as an institution serving a black population that was created before 1964. And that has to do with the fact that in 1964, the Civil Rights Act was passed, which made racial segregation, as Sidney mentioned, uh, illegal. And so that's our working definition. And the next slide is a map that shows you where the historically black colleges and universities are located. As you can tell, they are sort of geographically centered, mostly in the South. There are a few outside of the South. Uh, this map also doesn't have, there's a medical school in California, Drew University Medical School, that's it's on the list of HBCUs. But by, the overwhelming majority are in the Southeast from Texas on up to, to Delaware. And that's, that's the, where the majority are. And on the other side, you see a list of the number of states in U.S. territory. The U.S. Virgin Islands has one. University of Virgin Islands has one location uh, as well. And so Alabama actually has the honor of offering 16 individual historically Black colleges and universities, the most in the country. So the overwhelming majority of them are located in the deep south where uh, the majority of the Black population is located. Uh, next slide. And so what I did was uh, uh, I want to offer a few slides here, sort of giving you a, a visual uh, sense of what the campuses of some of these historically Black colleges look like. And, and so I, I made my choices based on uh, the recent Newsweek magazine top 10 HBCUs for 2021. And so you see Spelman College on your left and in the middle, uh, Tuskegee University and then Fisk University. And then on the bottom, uh, Howard University and, and Hampton University. And the next slide will have uh, Morehouse College where I uh, attended uh, and taught. Uh, Claflin University, Florida A&M, uh, Xavier University, and then North Carolina uh, Agriculture and Technical University. And then one more slide, the next slide. You can't leave out Delaware State. And Delaware State, uh, I, I put the, the image of the young women on the soccer team to show that HBCUs don't just serve uh, uh, African-American population. As you can see from, from the women on the soccer team, they are Hispanic women as well as uh, white women who are part of the student body of Delaware State University. So it's a lot of HBCUs, particularly those that serve, that are that were founded with government funds, they often tend to have a fairly diverse population in, in many cases. And Delaware State is, is an example of that. Okay, the next slide. So why do historically black colleges and universities exist? Well, as Sidney pointed out, that was a time in American history during the period of uh, enslavement of people of African descent where black pop black, the black population was largely denied educational opportunities. And in fact, when slavery was enforced in many states, it was illegal to educate a, a black enslaved person. And so after slavery ended in 1865, after the Civil War, what happened was to meet the great demand that uh, formerly enslaved Black people had for education, churches, uh, uh, the federal government, an agency called the Freedmen's Bureau, and then other private entities began to open schools to train, initially to train ministers and teachers. And these institutions, became colleges and universities. So for example, two classic examples, uh, Hampton University and Tuskegee started out as Hampton Institute and Tuskegee Institute. They did not offer college level education initially, but over time these institutions developed into what became uh, universities. And there's actually a, a debate between two uh, HBCUs in, in Pennsylvania over which one came first. Uh, I can't resolve that, that debate, but Cheney University claims to be the first in 1837. It didn't start out with the name Cheney University. It didn't start out as a university. 
Uh, and then Lincoln claims to be the first degree granting HBCU. So those are, are, are the, the, the first, however, which way you might choose to define. It. Now, in terms of the, the South, Atlanta University, which is part of something in Atlanta where I am called the Atlanta University Center. It's a, it's a, it's a consortium of HBCUs that includes uh, Clark Atlanta University, uh, Atlanta University and Clark College merged in 1988 to become Clark Atlanta University. So you have Clark Atlanta University, you have Spelman College, you have Morehouse College, and you have uh, a the theological center called the Interdenominational Theological Center or ITC. And then you have the Morehouse School of Medicine. So that makes up the consortium of the Atlanta University Center and it's sort of the largest collection of HBCUs in, in the country. And so, uh, these institutions were necessary for the black population because after the Civil War, what began was a, a, a practice of racial segregation that kept black people out of white colleges and universities with, with a few exceptions. Elite institutions such as uh, Harvard and, and Columbia did uh, in, uh, enroll a small number of black students. So for example, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois was the first African-American to earn a PhD in history from Harvard University in 1895. And I think it also should be pointed out that there has been sort of a, a very um, uh, troubled kind of relationship between the status of black people and these same uh, elite universities that uh, admitted a limited number of, of black people. And so because of the the, the, the prevalence of, of slavery in this country. Most of the elite universities had some kind of direct relationship with the institution of slavery. And so, for example, Brown University was in, in, uh, in, in, in uh, Rhode Island, is named after a, a slave trader named Nicholas Brown, Dartmouth College president, Nathan Lord, defended slavery right up until the Civil War. Uh, many of Columbia University's presidents and treasurers were slaveholders. Georgetown University was in financial trouble in the 1830s, and in order to pull itself out of financial trouble, it sold, uh, in one case, 272 enslaved persons, and then on another instance in the same year, 1838, it sold another 68, and it, it, it used, the university was able to rescue itself out of financial trouble by selling those, those, those persons. And Harvard also had part of its, its, its foundation laid by a, a, a slaveholder, Isaac Royal, who donated land and money to what became Harvard University. And the university also adopted part of the Royal Family Crest as part of its official university crest. Uh, John Hopkins was founded by a slaveholder named Johns Hopkins, who owned four enslaved persons. And Yale University is also named for a slave trader by the name of Elihu Yale. And at the moment, I'm in, I retired from Morehouse and I'm at Emory University in, in the School of Theology. It too was a slaveholding institution in the early part of the 1800s. And its original campus in, in Oxford, Georgia was actually partly constructed with the use of, of enslaved labor. And so slavery runs far wide and deep in, in the annals of American higher education. And so when you look at HBCUs, then what we see is, is a, a, a mixture of different kinds of institutions. They are both public, and that means that they are sponsored by state governments, or uh, they are either private, many of them are private, uh, many of them are four-year, some are two-year institutions, uh, some offer master's degrees and PhD degrees. Uh, some offer law degrees. Some offer uh, dental uh, school degrees, uh, medical. There are three medical schools in the family of HBCUs, and then there's one veterinary school of medicine uh, at Tuskegee. And so you get a, a variety of, of different uh, degree offerings at HBCUs. And uh, today there are not quite 300,000 students who attend HBCUs. And 
uh, they come from all kinds of ethnic and racial backgrounds. And in my time at Morehouse College, I actually had student. I had students from India. Had a, a number of students from 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 various parts of West Africa. I have had white students, and in fact, about five years ago, Morehouse College had a white uh, valedictorian. Uh, and I've had students from Vietnam, Korean students, and so it's just, it's, it can be fairly diverse. And the, 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 the distinction for HBCUs is that they don't exist anywhere else in the world except for the United States and its territory uh, of the Virgin Islands. And the next slide. And so when you look at the contemporary purpose of HBCUs, primarily they started out at, with the mission of educating the disadvantaged. And then over time, what happens, and I'll just use Morehouse College as an example because I know more about this story than I do the others in terms of their educational mission. Uh, leadership training became a sort of a paradigm and a mission. And so what Morehouse does is it, 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 it practices what uh, a friend of mine calls pedagogical personalism. And what I mean by pedagogical personalism is that when in the early part of the 20th century, uh, President John Hope, who was pre first black president of Morehouse College, he address the students. And Morehouse is the only all-male educational institution for Black men in the entire world. John Hope addressed the young men who came to Morehouse College as young gentlemen. And this was because in the Deep South, it was uh, unusual to accord any kind of personal dignity or wealth or respect for black persons. And so he felt that it was necessary for the uh, development of these young men that they know that they were persons of value. And so he started to call them, he called every student young gentleman. And when I came to Morehouse College myself as a student, I remember that all of my professors called me Mr. Lee. And when I became a faculty member there, I began to call my students, Mr. And, and, the, and the occasional Clark Atlanta or Spelman student, I would call them Miss. And so this kind of idea of respecting the person uh, and the dignity of the students was something that I picked up. And it's been a longstanding tradition. And at the time, I didn't realize what the root of it was, but now I have an understanding of, of why that is. And so when we talk about pedagogical personalism, we're talking about educating young Black men with an appreciation for their self-worth as human beings. And then the, the education that they receive is not for their own personal benefit in terms of uh, uh, any kind of high title they may attain or any money they may make in their profession, but their education is about advancing the cause of their people, particularly as it relates to social justice. And so that's what we mean by pedagogical personalism. You, you, you value the, the person, as a personal word, and then you send them out with the mission of improving society wherever it is that this student will go once that student graduates. And so a lot of HBCUs have a similar kinds of missions uh, that they operate from. And one of the other things too that, that became a result of this kind of approach to education is that when we get to the civil rights movement of the 1960s, the student movement grows explicitly out of a relationship between the students from black colleges, HBCUs, and the black church. And so the black church and the students work together to create what became the, the student movement. And people like Benjamin Mays, who was president of Morehouse College from the 1940s up until uh, the 1970s, made it a point to, to tell his students that they had an obligation to go out and fight against racial discrimination. And so he trained a whole generation of, of, of freedom fighters. And also, because you have, a, a, at the same time, a simultaneous uh, African nationalist movement in which African nations were fighting against European colonialism, you have a number of African 
people who will become national presidents who come to the United States and train and, and get education that they cannot get in their colonized uh, countries. And at HBCUs, you will also get exposure to co African culture uh, and history uh, as part of the black diaspora. And we talk about diaspora, we talk about people of African ancestry who have been dispersed uh, around the world. And one of the things that I noticed when I was still at Morehouse College is that a number of the students often came uh, without uh, understanding of what the black experience was. And that what I mean by that is that they were raised in an environment in which the, most of the people in their environment were not black people. So they, they came to an HBCU to get a, a, a black experience, if you will. And when you're on a, a campus of, of an uh, HBCU, there's a kind of freedom that you can't find in a lot of other places. And so you can be honest and express yourself in a way where you feel safe in doing so. And this goes for faculty and students. And so you don't have to worry about being on edge about how people will receive whatever opinion you might have. You just have that, that, kind, of, that kind of intellectual freedom. And you also get uh, yourself in an environment where people understand you and you don't have to explain yourself to everybody that you meet. And so these are all kinds of benefits uh, that we find at HBCUs. And the next slide. And I just wanted to give you a couple examples of some of the, the most noted African freedom fighters who came to the United States. And both of them actually attended Lincoln University in Pennsylvania in the 30s. Kwame Nkrumah on the left, uh, who became the first uh, African president uh, of Ghana, and Namde Azikiwe, uh, who uh, came from uh, Nigeria uh, and became his, his first African president. Both of these uh, free African nation, nationalists uh, were taught and came to the United States. And this sort of helped to create uh, a understanding between diasporic Black people in America and then uh, people, continental Africans, about the commonality of the struggle that they faced at the same time. And so they were able to learn from each other and then they could take things that they learned about their own history that they learned in the United States that they couldn't get in their colonized African nations. And then I also mentioned before how HBCU students were really the, the genesis of the American civil rights movement in terms of student activism. And so the student movement in this country began on February 1st in 1960 at an HBCU called North Carolina A&T University. And the next slide. One of the well, most noted contributions of an HBCU, it revolves around something that is referred to as the Tuskegee Airmen of World War II. And so in, during World War II, um, the American military was segregated and the opportunities for service for black uh, soldiers was very limited by their racial identity. And so black people in the military were segregated into all black units. And up to World War II, there were no black uh, pilots. And so what happened at Tuskegee was that the a training program to train black pilots began in 1943. And over the course of World War II, and shortly thereafter, 922 pilots, mostly black, but a few Hispanic, were trained at uh, the Tuskegee Airfield. And during the war, they flew 1,578 missions and they became one of the best bomber units in the armed forces. And many of the pilots uh, received accommodation for their, their, their service. And this group of, of, of Tuskegee Airmen produced the first black four-star general who was Daniel Chappie James Jr. Next slide. And uh, more contemporarily and also historically, the contributions of HBCU has been legendary. And as was already mentioned, our current vice president, uh, Kamala Harris, uh, graduated from Howard University in the 1980s, somewhere around 85 or 86, or somewhere in that area. Uh, one of the most noted uh, scholars of the 20th century, W.B. Du Bois, graduated from Fisk University before he got his PhD at Harvard. 
And of course, I already mentioned was Lord Martin Luther King Jr. who graduated from Morehouse College. And then representing Delaware State University uh, under the presidency of George W. Bush, uh, Clyde Bishop became the US ambassador to the Marshall Islands from 2006 to 2009. And uh, the internationally recognized media mogul, Oprah Winfrey uh, is a, a alumni, alumni of uh, Tennessee State University in Nashville, Tennessee. And on the next slide, we have more uh, distinguished HBCU graduates. Uh, James Clyburn is a U.S. Congressman representing the state of South Carolina. He attended South Carolina State University, and he played a, a major role in, in the outcome of the last presidential ele uh, election, uh, giving uh, now President uh, Biden a, a big boost that led to his ultimate victory. Uh, from Claflin University, uh, uh, a state Supreme Court judge, Judge Ernest Finney, uh, one of the best noted figures in terms of uh, child education and children's issues is a Spelman graduate, uh, Marion Wright Edelman. And I didn't have room to put this on the slide, but I think it's worth mentioning that uh, also related to the political outcome of our past election in the United States, uh, a Spelman graduate, uh, and political genius, Stacey Abrams, had a lot to do with engineering some of the, the outcome of the last national election and, and also statewide races across the, the country. And we also have uh, Dr. Ruth Simmons, who went to Dillard University in New Orleans. She was past president, the first black president of uh, Brown University. And the late Dr. Ronald McNair, who was an astronaut on the space shuttle Challenger. Uh, this, this, is, this is the space shuttle that incinerated uh, while on his mission. And so he passed in, in, that, in that accident, but he graduated from North Carolina State University and went on to get a, a PhD at MIT. And then this woman on the far right, Katherine Johnson, she was a, a, a groundbreaking uh, Ma uh, mathematician with NASA, our space agency, who graduated from West Virginia State University, and I also there's a very that was a very good movie that came out called Hidden Figures, and this this movie Hidden Figures I, I recommend it highly tells the story uh, uh, of Katherine Johnson and what she did uh, in the 50s with uh, and 60s with NASA at a time when women were not doing the kinds of things that she was doing. She was actually sort of more like a human computer. And she was verifying the math mathematical calculations that astronauts needed in order to venture into space and return safely. Uh, next slide. Now, uh, one of the issues that has come up both here in the United States and in, in, in the UK is that given the legacy of the enslavement of people of African descent, uh, there has emerged this uh, reparations uh, movement. It, it, it's very strong uh, in, in the Caribbean. And I do know that uh, there was a bill proposed in the UK around this issue uh, and In the United States, there are 37 million people of African descent, which represents about 12% of the US population. And in the, the United Kingdom, there are about 1.9 million people of African descent, which is about 3% of the, the total population in, in the UK. And about 10 years ago, Emory University, uh, put a large display in its main library about its role in the enslavement of people of African descent. And Emory just recently installed a new president. And one of the first things that the new president did was to issue a statement during the Black Lives Matter dust up uh, last summer when George Floyd was murdered, that he wanted to ensure the Emory, Emory community that Emory University's campus would be a safe place for everybody 
uh, and that the, the problems that you saw around the country with police brutality would not happen at Emory. And he also made mention of the fact that there would be a conference in the fall of 2021 around uh, Emory's role in terms of the, the its enslavement of, of Black people. And so one of the things that occurred to me that while a conference is good, is not good enough. And so I'm somewhat persuaded to push Emory, since I'm, I'm enrolled there, a little further to do more because uh, there is some kind of way to, to, to move closer toward a, a reconciliation for the things that were done the clear, that were clearly unjust. And I cannot tell people in the UK what they, what they should do, but certainly one idea that could be considered is that with the United States being the only place where there are HBCUs, perhaps there's room uh, there for the presence of institutions that could address the educational needs of people of African descent in the UK and other places across the continent of Europe as well. And so with that, I'll leave it and turn it over to the host of this program. Thank you so much, Professor Lee, for such an interesting insight and introduction to that historical and cultural position of historically black colleges and universities in the United States. I know I certainly took a lot from that talk and I'm sure many people who are joining us this evening will have done as well. So thank you so much. Um, now that we have some more of that context about HBCUs, um, we're now going to kind of switch gears a little bit and take a look about what it's like to be a student on campus at, at a HBCU in the US. And to help us do that, we're joined by a panel of admissions representatives from several different HBCUs of different types throughout uh, several different states in the United States. Uh, before we do that, and before we welcome our first speaker, I want to just briefly introduce myself and Education USA, which is the organization uh, that I represent. Um, so my name is Holly Haig, and I'm one of two Education USA advisors here in the UK. Um, and what is Education USA? Well, we are part of a global network um, of around 600 advisors across 400 centers worldwide. Um, and we offer free up-to-date, non-biased information uh, and advice to UK students who are interested in applying to universities in the US. So it was your dream to go over to the US and potentially, you know, go to a HBCU. Um, that is something that we're here to help you with. And so we'll put um, at the end of this presentation, when we get to the Q&A, we can put our information in the chat if anyone has any questions to talk more generally about the um, admissions process with us. But without further ado, that's enough information from me. I'm now going to introduce uh, our first speaker, who is Chelsea Holly from Spelman College. Uh, Chelsea serves as the Interim Director of Admissions at Spelman College. Prior to her tenure at Spelman, she's worked at a diverse range of institutions, including Emory University, Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, Ms. Holly holds a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Communication and a Master's um, in Higher Education Leadership. She's currently completing her doctorate in sociology and researching the ways in which high achieving underrepresented students can navigate their path to elite selective institutions. I'll now hand over to Chelsea. Thanks so much, Holly. And thank you, Dr. Lee, for that amazing intro. Um, to give context to our presentations today. Um, as Holly mentioned, my name is Chelsea Holly. I have the pleasure to serve as the Interim Director of Admissions at Spelman College. So as we're talking about HBCUs, um, we're talking about a very specific type of institution. Um, Spelman College sits at the intersection of a number of these institutions. So we are, of course, a historically black college. We are also a liberal arts institution, as well as a women's college. Um, and so all of these different institutional profiles come together as a common thread throughout our academic curriculum, 
our support services, um, the student life and environment that we have on campus. Um, so I want you to think about these institutional categories as we're talking about what it's like to be a Spelman student, and then ultimately what we're looking for um, as a competitive applicant to Spelman. So we are located in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I am born and raised in Atlanta, so I am incredibly partial. I could talk about Atlanta all day. As Dr. Lee shared, we are part of the Atlanta University Center. Um, so there is certainly a shared campus community between Spelman, Clark Atlanta University, as well as Morehouse College. Um, a lot of our student life, uh, annual events are shared events. Uh, we also have the ability to cross-register students. So if there is a course um, that is offered at Morehouse or Clark Atlanta, our students are able to take that course there and the reverse. Um, so while we are a single gender um, institution, we do have male students who might end up taking courses on our campus. Um, and then we certainly take advantage of the courses offered by our neighbors as well. Um, for many people, Atlanta um, is our airport. So if you all have flown into the States, you may be familiar with Hartsville International. Um, we are the busiest airport in the United States. Um, and many of the um, different folks that come through Atlanta have really created an international business footprint here in the city. Um, we're home to about 16 Fortune 500 companies. Um, a number of uh, companies are flocking to Atlanta for a number of reasons all of the time. Um, and then finally, we talk a lot about college towns, um, but Atlanta is a college city. We have the highest concentration of high school, or I'm sorry, college students um, in a metro area. So we've named um, a few of the institutions in Georgia here. Um, there's certainly our HBCUs in the city, um, but we also have Emory University. We have University of Georgia, Georgia State University. So this list is quite long. Um, and what this provides for our students is a culture um, and opportunities that is very focused on supporting students throughout their four years in college and then certainly after. So these are some of our points of pride. Um, there are tons of things that make me entirely um, excited to be working at Spelman, um, but these are the things I think that stand out the most and that people think of when they think of Spelman. Um, so we are the number one historically black college and university uh, for 14 years straight. Uh, we're the number one producer of black women who go on to complete PhDs in STEM fields. Um, this is an amazing pride point because we are a liberal arts institution. Um, you don't always associate um, a pipeline into STEM PhDs with liberal arts, but that is something that Spelman has crafted both intentionally and then um, our research capacity as well as faculty members um, really make that an organic piece of the Spelman experience. Number four in top performers on social mobility. Um, so this is the ability for students to change the trajectory of their legacy from generation to generation. Um, and so we are about 70% Pell eligible students. Um, and so in the States that is um, a student that might receive um, free or reduced lunch um, or any other benefits that would put them either in a low income category or a low middle income category. Um, and so that is certainly something that we are really, really proud of. And then finally, number 10 in most innovative schools. Um, this piece is a merging of technology, of art and design. Our current president, Dr. Mary Schmidt Campbell, um, comes from the art world as a curator, um, and she has made it um, a very intentional piece of our mission to make sure that we are cutting edge um, in a number of spaces. So I would be remiss if I did not share um, some of our amazing alumni as we're talking about Pride Points. Um, Dr. Lee mentioned Stacey Abrams um, a little bit earlier, uh, but she has certainly had uh, an amazing career in law and policy, um, but certainly the past four years for Stacey have been absolutely um, groundbreaking. Um, she has fought for and protected voters' rights, not only in Georgia, um, but also across the nation. And as Dr. Lee alluded to, um, she is widely credited um, with helping uh, the success of our most recent presidential election, um, as well as our Senate election. 
Um, over here on the right, we have Roz Brewer. Um, Roz Brewer, of course, is an alumni of Spelman College. Um, she has been recently named as the CEO of Walgreens, so she will assume her post on March 15th. Um, prior to Walgreens, she served as the COO at Starbucks. Roz will be the only Black woman to lead a Fortune 500 company um, as she assumes this next role, uh, which will be absolutely critical as we are facing the pandemic and vaccinations. So she will play a large role in this. Um, and we know that uh, the Black community has been um, adversely affected by the pandemic. Um, so we know that this will be front and center in her leadership moving forward. Um, I love sharing our alumni stories because I think it is the best representation of what Spelman gives back to our students and ultimately the women that they go on to be. Um, and so if you take anything away from what Spelman women are like, and certainly Spelman alumni, um, they are leaders. Uh, and this leadership development is not accidental. Um, it is engineered and intentional from the students that are coming in their freshman year to the courses that we're able to offer, um, the support services, as well as the things that they're doing outside of the classroom. So academics, we have 34 majors and minors on our campus. Um, many of our students go on to professional schools. So whether that is medical, law, um, completing a PhD, we have really um, strong pathways into these professional schools. Uh, we also have special collaborations with uh, Georgia Tech, which is an engineering partnership. Um, we participate in this uh, dual degree engineering with a number of institutions, um, both in Georgia as well as nationally. Uh, we have an amazing partnership with Emory University that feeds into their nursing program. Um, so students would complete uh, three years at Spelman and then go on and finish their nursing degree at Emory University. Um, we have early assurance partnerships with some of the best medical schools in the nation. Um, the same thing with our law schools. So I think from the beginning that students um, set foot on our campus, we are having them thinking about what's next. Um, the quality of our students, they're typically coming in already with these really ambitious goals. Um, and so it is our job to help support those students and give them a roadmap to that next step. Um, our most popular majors on campus, biology, economics, psychology, um, we do have a lot of students that might major in the humanities, so sociology, sociology women's comparative studies. Um, so we do have very traditional um, liberal arts disciplines that are also widely popular on our campus. So outside of the classroom, this is specifically about study abroad. Uh, part of Spelman's mission is not just focused on African Americans, but we are focused globally on women from African descent. So all of our students not only have a global perspective in the material that they're learning, but they're also encouraged to explore um, and operationalize that perspective through study abroad experiences. So these could be research opportunities, service. Um, we have international exchange programs where students can spend a semester or a year abroad. Um, so about 70% of our students actually participate in study abroad um, by the time that they graduate, which is um, a, certainly a very high number at the national um, stage for students to study abroad. Student life and engagement. Um, one thing that struck me when I came to Spelman is how many student organizations we have. Um, we have a incredibly diverse student body um, that have different interests, um, uh, different career paths that they'd like to take on. Um, and that's really reflected in our student organization. So we are a school of just 2000 students, um, 85 student organizations, we have 11, 11 residential halls. Um, students are required to stay on campus for two years. So both that first year and the second year, we do have a residency requirement. Um, that requirement really is foundational um, in the sisterhood that students are building um, over that two year period, as well as them fully being um, ingrained into the campus culture here at Spelman. Um, if you talk to any alumni of Spelman, um, whether they are five years out of the college or 20 years out of the college, they have enormous pride of their residential hall. 
calls. Um, and I think that really speaks to um, kind of the magic that happens that those first two years. Um, we are welcoming young women in that are used to being the only Black student in their classroom, um, or they are used to folks not understanding them, or um, we see these themes throughout all of our applications. And when you take all of these women that have felt like outsiders um, and put them together, there really is a certain magic um, that happens. And I think the residence halls those first two years are instrumental in that. Civic and community engagement is huge. Um, that is also at the heart of our mission. Um, and when we think about a Spelman woman, she is certainly civically engaged um, and is really looking at how she can make a difference in the world. And then finally, I talked about this a little bit earlier, but AUC events and traditions are huge, um, not only on Spelman's campus, uh, but also on all of the campuses in the AUC, as well as the city of Atlanta. Um, people from around the nation flock to Atlanta each year for our homecoming. Um, I think we have all been pretty sad that there was no Spellhouse homecoming this year, um, but we are hopeful that we will be back gathering and having um, really that, that special bond um, on campus and in our community really soon. So support services, this is again, um, a major role um, in shaping uh, our students and our graduates. Um, our career planning and development department um, does an amazing job of engaging students from their very first semester on our campus. Um, we have a number of corporations that are really knocking our doors down to get to our graduates. Um, and it, it's amazing feeling to um, to that value recognized by all. Um, our health and wellness initiatives are um, also central. We are focused on a multi-dimensional definition of health and wellness. So yes, we have a state-of-the-art uh, wellness center with an Olympic-style swimming pool, a weight room, basketball courts, um, but we also are extremely focused on mental health as well as spiritual health. So we have a Sisters Chapel, um, which is our chapel on campus. Um, there are services each Sunday, as well as virtual services that we've been hosting for the past year. Um, and our Student Success Center. Uh, another thing about our population, they are used to exceeding um, and oftentimes being the smartest student in their high school classrooms. Um, and Spelman challenges our students academically. Um, it's a good challenge, and we hope that as they're being challenged, you're also reaching out and using some of those support services that we have available. So whether it's the writing center or tutoring or our accessibility office, these are all um, services that are here to prop our students up and make sure that they make it through uh, the four-year journey. So I've, I've talked a lot about the Spelman woman, um, and we, we talk about this typically from a graduate perspective, um, but we're also looking at these same uh, characteristics as we are reviewing applications. So when we see a freshman admissions come across, uh, admissions application come across our desk, these are some of the things that we're looking for. Um, a strong academic curriculum. So a student that challenged themselves given the uh, curriculum they had access to. Um, so if a student has access to advanced coursework, we would like to see that they took advantage of that opportunity and challenged themselves. Demonstrated leadership involvement. Um, our students are amazing leaders. Uh, I am constantly impressed at the things that our students have accomplished in their 17 or 18 years of life as they're coming in. Um, and so that is certainly a large theme in what we're looking for. Um, community service, uh, that is another piece that our students typically will display. Um, and then finally, strong ability to convey thoughts and ideas. Um, at Spelman, students are finding their voice, they're crafting their voice, um, and we really like to see that displayed in their essays early on, in the ways they talk about the things that they want to accomplish. Um, and a lot of that is being introspective and also having intellectual curiosity. So I wanted to share a little bit about our admitted student profile. This is from fall 2020. 
Um, we made the decision to go test optional for this current admission cycle. Um, and so we are not requiring test scores currently. We've yet to make an announcement for the 21-22 application cycle, but that information will be forthcoming in the next month. Um, so our average student profile for GPA is a 3.77. That is a weighted GPA. I know that GPAs and class ranks look quite different um, for our international students. We do recalculate all of our GPAs in-house. So if you're looking at this and you are on a percentage scale or a 5.0 scale, um, we are able to assess your transcript and make sure that we are comparing students on even playing field. Um, prior to us going test optional, that average SAT score was an 1182 and the average ACT score was a 24. So we are on the common application exclusively, so we do not accept applications from any other means. Um, there is a $40 online application fee. Uh, we require official high school transcripts, all of your official high school transcripts if you've been to multiple institutions, um, official SAT or ACT scores if you've taken them. Um, for our UK students, your A-levels and your O-levels um, are part of your application requirements. Um, I see many international students that may not have been um, educated in the British uh, high school system, so they may not have the A or O levels. Um, feel free to connect with us directly if you feel like um, you're not able to produce any of the application components. Um, and then finally, two letters of recommendations. Uh, we really like to see recommendations coming from um, faculty that know you well, um, that can attest to your fit for Spelman. Um, so just a, a tip, uh, make sure that your recommenders know uh, about the schools that you're applying to so that they can easily um, convey why you are a good fit for that institution. And then finally, um, connect with us. Um, so these are our admissions counselors. I am the international admissions counselor, so you can reach out to me directly with any questions you have about international admissions. Um, the rest of my team is divided up between different states in the United States, um, and you'll also see their information there. Um, if you do nothing today, I encourage you to follow us on Instagram. Our assistant director, Nayada Schuler, does an amazing job um, with our Instagram content. Um, we are incredibly active and we're always looking to connect with students on our social media platforms. Um, again, thank you, Holly, for having Spellman um, and having me to talk a little bit about our admissions process. Um, and I will go ahead and pass the mic. Thank you so much, Chelsea, and thank you for that great introduction to Spellman. I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions in the Q&A, um, getting some more insight into what it's like to go to a historically Black institution, but also a women's college at the same time. Um, so I'm now going to introduce our next speaker, who is Kanisha Keith. Um, Kanisha is the admissions counselor for transfer and international students at Delaware State University. And Delaware State University is the most diverse and contemporary HBCU in the United States of America, founded in 1891 as a land grant institution. And so I'd like to welcome Kanisha to join us. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We truly appreciate it. I'm going to share my screen. Alrighty, so again, my name is Kenesha Keith. I am the admissions coordinator here at Delaware State University. I do oversee the transfer students, returning and international students, but I am super excited to assist anyone that comes my way. We have a fantastic presentation for you guys, and I hope you have a great time watching it. If you have not had the opportunity to see our commercial that has been going viral on TV as well as social media, please take a look at it now. From open house to acceptance, new student orientation, and picking the program that's just for you, it matters. From scholarships to meeting with advisors and making new friends, and all of the campus life and activities, it matters. Continued one-on-one -on -one support, student success planning, internship to graduation, and landing your dream job in your career field, it matters. Because at Delaware State University, it all matters. So yes, you will definitely hear me say that a lot and also throughout the other videos that we have for you guys. It definitely all matters. Um, that is our, our model that we are going by. 
Um, and it just pretty much, it all matters. That means you matter, everything else matters. Um, we just truly believe um, that everything matters in life, especially during these times. We wanna make sure that everyone has an equal opportunity here at Delaware State University. So that's something that we can definitely provide. So this is our view book. I can definitely drop this link for you guys. Um, what I love about this front cover is it definitely shows um, you know, where we came from and then definitely where we are now. Delaware State University was founded in 1891 as a land grant institution. And it actually only started off with only 20 acres of land. And currently we have over 350 acres now. So we have definitely grown uh, majorly in that aspect of things. Um, but it's just truly, uh, to see that diverse change. Um, so we were definitely um, founded as to provide people of color a wonderful education, but um, we definitely expand that. And we just uh, pretty much want to make sure that everyone knows that everyone has an equal opportunity here at Delaware State University, regardless of your skin, your native tongue, um, how old you are, if you have disabilities or not, um, there's definitely room for you here at Delaware State University. And just some fun facts about um, Delaware State University's for our incoming freshmen, we produce $9.4 million just in scholarships alone. We have uh, over 5,000 individuals, uh, as far as students are concerned, on our campus. Um, student to faculty ratio is 16 to 1. And we are extremely diverse. So we have about 60% African-American here, um, here on campus and the 40% would be Caucasian, Asian, Hispanic, and other. So again, we truly believe that everyone deserves the equal and fair opportunity. And that's definitely something that you can um, obtain here at Delaware State University. We actually are the only HBCU institution to have a partnership with the US.Dreamers. Um, that pretty much allows uh, individuals who do not have official documentation to be in the United States, they can still come here to obtain a um, higher education degree. So uh, we just pride ourselves in giving people the opportunity to achieve their goals and ambitions. So also that you can find in the view book, that's what it's called. Uh, we have over 40 majors and over 30 minors. So there's definitely something for everyone here. Um, some of our top programs are definitely business, aviation, we have um, nursing, political science, mass comp. Uh, the list goes on. So I definitely will drop that link for you guys so you can take an opportunity to look at that and see if we have your majors that you're interested in. We are a hands-on academic institution, so we definitely have a learning program, uh, tutors that are available 24-7 in any subject that you're uh, majoring in or interested in taking. We have over 100 student organizations on campus, and a wonderful thing about Delaware State University is um, if there is an organization that you don't see or that you would like to start up, you definitely have that option to do that, um, and we love um, having the opportunity for our students because once they graduate, they're leaving that legacy on for other students to join and continue to build that program. We are Division One institution. <laughs> Sorry, we are a Division One institution, so that definitely means we play with the big leagues. So we are definitely on TV, showing our skills. So it's definitely an awesome time to see uh, Delaware State University on TV. We have an awesome band, um, a band uh, group or sports, whatever you would like to call it. I definitely was a part of the band. So it definitely is awesome to have additional friends and um, additional people that you can hang out with outside of your academic party. We have um, over nine residence halls. We actually just built one last year. So I'm super jealous I didn't get to stay there. Obviously you guys can tell I graduated from Delaware State University, um, but I'm super jealous. But we do have a wonderful video about the uh, residence hall is super nice, flat screen TVs everywhere. Again, I'm just super jealous I didn't get to stay there. But again, this is our view book. It has wonderful facts about Delaware State University, um, all the opportunities that we offer. And again, I will definitely drop that link for you guys so you can have a chance to look at it for yourself. So um, we definitely like to share this report that came out in 2021, U.S. News and World Report uh, HBCU ranking. We actually rank number third out of the public HBCUs in America. And then we also rank number 11 amongst all private and public uh, schools in the United States. So we're definitely um, honored to be top three uh, public HBCU 
in the United States. Last year, we were number five. Uh, so next year, I know Spellman said they were number one, but we are looking to be number one next year. So definitely look out for those numbers. And again, we are just continuing to trailblaze um, in different avenues uh, with new majors, new buildings, new opportunities for our students. Um, and we are just truly uh, excited about this new merge that we are taking place. So let's definitely talk about how you can be accepted into Delaware State University as an international student. First, you definitely have to apply online and that's gonna be directly on our website. The application fee is $35, but since you're joining me here today, we're gonna to waive that fee for you. It's gonna be GIFT2021, that's all caps and that's one word. So GIFT2021. You also have to submit your test scores as well as your academic transcripts. We accept um, transcripts from WES or ECE evaluation organizations. Minimum GPA does have to be a 2.0. And then the test scores that we require are the list below. So that will be um, SAT, ACT, TOEFL, um, the ELI program that we offer here at Delaware State University. So definitely take a screenshot at our requirements. And um, we do not recommend any recommendation letters. A lot of people say, oh my God, your GPA is so low. Um, again, that is because we definitely believe that everyone deserves an equal and fair opportunity um, at an education. If you ever want to reach out to us, here is our contact information. Um, you can definitely give us a phone call or well as email us or directly email me. Again, my email address is kkeith at desu.edu. So definitely take a look at that. And I am going to stop sharing my screen at this point, but uh, thank you so much for joining us. It was a wonderful time uh, speaking to everyone today. Thank you so much, Kanisha, and what a great insight into some of the offerings that Delaware State has. Um, we're now going to move on to our third and final speaker this evening, um, who is Pamela Crawford at Claflin University. Originally from New York City, Pamela has been in South Carolina for nine years and with Claflin University for eight of those. Um, as the International and Transfer Admissions Counselor, she assists students throughout the admissions process. And as well, she is the designated school officer or DSO. And so Pam represents international students in all matters relating to their visa as an F1 student. And so really happy to hand over to Pam. And we'll have some slides in the background that we're going to share to go with it. Um, just want to share a little bit of information about Claflin University. Um, Claflin is a national student-centered, career-oriented, four-year co-educational residential liberal arts university affiliated with the United Methodist Church. Historically, Claflin University was founded in 1869. It's one of the oldest historically Black colleges or university in South Carolina. It's also the first institution of higher education to welcome all students regardless of race, gender, religious, or ethnic origin. <clears throat> Claflin's vision um, is for students um, to be visionary leaders uh, in a global perspective, especially today um, with what's going on, we really wanna make sure our students, you know, achieve all of those um, goals as far as going away, going overseas, we, we also have uh, international, a large international base um, of students who come to us. Um, our Claflin University is located in Orangeburg, South Carolina. It's actually about 40 miles from the state capital in Columbia. The student, um, the faculty on campus is a 131 full-time faculty. Um, the ratio from student to faculty is 13 to 1. The academic year consists of fall and spring semesters and one summer semester. For international students, that's really key because it allows them to participate in CPT, having internships and being able to make a little money for themselves. Uh, usually international students are not allowed to work off campus. Um, but they do have on-campus um, jobs as well. And as far as enrollment, um, the university internship uh, enrolls interns, international students consistently. Um, I assist all students throughout their admission process. 
we have approximately 2,000 undergrad, undergraduate and graduate students from all regions of the United States and 19 countries. The academic programs consist of the School of Business, the School of Humanities and Social Justice, the School of Natural Sciences and Mathematics, um, and also Center for Professional and Continuing Studies. The university also offers master's degrees in organizational management and criminal justice. The master's degree program, uh, the MBA program, uh, are all located in the School of Business. Um, the university also offers a RN to BSM, which is mostly online. The course for Claflin University is 26,618. The majority of our international students who arrive on campus go through Honors College for their scholarships. Some of the requirements would be West Transcript Evaluation, Recommendation Letters, the SAT or the ACT uh, score reports, and the students can also submit any certificates or awards that they've received um, from their home countries. Financial aid is available to most students, but unfortunately, international students are not able to receive financial aid. But we do try and make sure that they have a large access to international um, positions that they can work during the summer for internships. The university provides comprehensive programs in health. Um, I usually assist the students, the international students, with um, obtaining medical insurance. So that's something we do one-on-one. -on -one. I assist all international graduates with OPT as they graduate and go into their own careers. Um, the college also has NCAA Division II, Southern Intercollegial Athletic Conference, men's teams, including basketball, baseball, track, and field, um, field and track across country women's team, including basketball, softball, and volleyball. Um, as, you, as the international students prepare to come, I'm usually sharing videos with them about on-campus life. It's, it's not, it's traditional for U.S. students to come to Claflin University, but international students are not able to do that. So it really gives me a lot of pleasure to show them what life at Claflin University is really like. I believe from the slide that was shared, you can see some of the information I've already shared about SAT scores. The average ACT score is 21. The GPA is 3.5, and um, there's a lot of other information that I will share with students one-on-one -on -one as they contact me with their interest in attending Claflin University. Um, so that's it for my information today, and I'll be available for any questions um, after the session. Thank you all so much, and thank you, Pam, for sharing that really interesting insight into Claflin. Uh, we're now going to open uh, up the floor to any questions from anyone who's tuning in tonight. Um, and so we'll give you all a moment that if you do have any questions you'd like to ask to any one of our panelists, um, that you are able to do so using the Q&A function. Um, so I'll just give everyone a moment to add any questions they would like. And then Sydney and I will get started. Okay, well, just um, while we are waiting for, for questions, if anyone has them from the audience, I, I want to be cognizant of, of time. I know we've gone a little over, so thank you all for, for sticking with us. Um, I'd like to ask this question of, of both Chelsea and Kanisha. Um, for international students who might not want to study with the, for a full four-year degree, are there opportunities for people to do short-term programs um, or non-degree programs at your universities? Um, so yes, we have both uh, exchange programs that are semester long. Um, we also accept guest students. Um, typically we see the guest students coming either their junior or senior year from their home institution. Um, so absolutely doable. I would say um, our most popular programs, we have tons of students that are coming from China, um, West Africa. Um, so we're, we're welcoming a number of different students for short stays as well. 
Yes, I'm going to piggyback off the same um, answer as well. We have a lot of uh, certificates that the students can uh, achieve as well. Um, so yes, that's the only add I'm going to add on to that. <laughs> Great, thank you both. And then I guess a question for Pamela and Dr. Lee. Um, what opportunities do you think attending a HBCU offers to a Black international student? And, you know, you can get as specific as a Black international student from the UK that is so unique and so different as an experience. We start with Professor Lee. Okay. Uh, well, um, there has been a long history of relationship between uh, people of African descent in this part of the diaspora, as well as uh, the diaspora of Black people in Britain, in the UK. And so one of the things that, that we still need to work on is to give more life to the, that relationship. And so it was, it was very vibrant up to the 60s. And then uh, for Americans to have the opportunity to meet international students is a critical part of growing up and becoming a global citizen. And so that's a very uh, big objective for uh, HBCUs is to expose their students to international, to the international dimensions of life. And so when, so Spellman mentioned there that very extensive uh, study abroad program. Morehouse also does study abroad. Uh, I got a chance to go to Shanghai, China and, and teach for two weeks at Shanghai University in 2012, teaching uh, American history to Chinese students and one Korean student. And then we also sent our Chinese study students to different you know, cities in China so that they can be exposed to, to uh, the students are in, uh, in, in that place. And so this kind of rich exchange is, is, is something that contemporary students are more and more becoming used to. And I think it's very necessary for us to, to see a picture ourselves in a larger uh, international dimension rather than just uh, citizens of one country without knowing anything about people from other places. So this is a way to do it. Great. Pamela, oh, do you have anything to add? For yeah, for Claflin University, I think um, we're, I'm from New York, a big city. So coming to Claflin as a small town, it's easier to get acclimated with your area. Um, I think when you attend school in a big city, it's more intimidating. Um, so it's less intimidating when you're in a small town. So I think that's one of the key things for international students, especially when they get to Orangeburg, they, like, they can settle in without feeling the stress of leaving home. Most international students, uh, this is their first time away from home. So I think part of my job is to help them get acclimated. And I think Orangeburg is the perfect location for that. Excellent. Um, okay, so we have a couple of questions coming in. And one, um, I'm hoping that all of you will maybe be able just to put your contact details in the chat for all of the students here. We have a couple of people who'd love to, to reach out after this. Um, and then uh, this is specifically to uh, Morehouse and Spellman. Um, Professor Lee, I know you're no longer there, so perhaps um, you won't be able to answer this, but the question is, is Morehouse, are Morehouse and Spellman colleges welcoming of trans students? Yeah, so I, I won't speak for Morehouse, um, but Spelman College has rolled out um, a gender policy, um, a new gender policy, maybe four years ago. Um, we've actually yet to have a trans student on our campus, but we have everything ready and waiting. Um, the Common App does ask that question. Um, so we are able to know that as part of the application process. Um, I found that trans applicants typically are very forthcoming um, and I encourage them to share as much or as little as you would like in the application process. Great. Yeah. And so as far as Morehouse College is concerned, Morehouse has also uh, instituted a new policy uh, about gender, about uh, sexual orientation. I don't have the details of it, but uh, they are, because Atlanta is a city 
that is known as a Mecca for people who are non-binary, who identify beyond sort of the, the, the hegemonic binary uh, gender identification models. And so you find at Morehouse among faculty and students, uh, among almost every kind of variety that you could think of in terms of people's identity around sexuality. And so it's a place where people come to Atlanta sometimes specifically for that reason. And so Morehouse is, has been a place where students can, can find uh, uh, a place to, 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 to be welcome into. Thank you both for that, for that insight. Um, another question that we have coming up in the, in the Q&A box is that it's very clear that HBCUs in general have a lot to offer for prospective students, including many different on-campus student organizations. And um, I guess this is a question more for the admissions reps, but are there specific opportunities or support networks on your campus for international students? And we can start with Pam, if you wanna speak to that a little bit, Claflin. Um, yes, we have the Global Student Organization. Um, it's a great organization. I think the communication between the students coming from different countries, it helps ease them further into campus life. So we have that global student organization. We have an event every year. And unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we were not able to have that event this year, but they just get a chance to celebrate their heritage. Um, there's a parade of flags um, to see different students celebrating their culture together uh, is always amazing to see. And so I think that's one of the benefits for Claflin University to have an organization um, focused for international students. Um, yes, as well, Delaware State University has the um, International Affairs Office who hosts uh, multiple events throughout the year. Um, as well as when students do apply for housing, that question is on the application. So we try to house um, international students together um, on the same floor. But um, of course, due to your certification, if you're a freshman or upperclassmen, you will still be kind of grouped together just so you can guys, you know, share your experiences as well as provide um, the United States students some of um, your experience as well, which will definitely build the partnership with um, our study abroad programs that we offer as well. And then I will just underscore everything that my colleagues have said. We also have our Gordon Zito Center for International Studies. Um, we have transition programs as well as ambassadors. Um, so current international students that are there to mentor and kind of guide new international students um, on campus. I know that it is a huge change. Um, and so I, I think they need all of the support that we're able to get. Um, I think there's also some space in the curriculum um, of courses that really kind of bridge uh, both African-American students as well as international students so that they're able to kind of see um, some of the, the similarities culturally and in our shared history. Um, so I believe that also really helps that transition. Okay, um, another question we have is about uh, interdisciplinary work. If someone wants to study music, business and French, um, are they able to do multiple disciplines at your universities? Maybe Chelsea, you wanna go first? Yeah, so I will say that part of the foundation of a liberal arts education um, addresses that very naturally. Um, so the first two years, all of our students are taking some really foundational courses um, that uh, lay the foundation for any discipline that they're going into. Um, we do allow students to major and minor. I talked about some of our partnerships across institutions. Um, so students are definitely able to specialize. We have independent majors um, and our students definitely take advantage of those independent majors as well. Um, so yes, I think there is tons of room um, for interdisciplinary work um, that is very central to a liberal arts mission, a women's college mission, and then of course Spelman. Same here at Claflin University. Um, uh, students can, you know, study what they, well, usually when they get here, they're undeclared. They're really not sure 
Um, so in my job, I really try and have that conversation with them. And once they get set in a course that they would like to study, um, they do have the opportunity to change courses. But in most cases, um, they can study whatever they like to study as far as the curriculum is concerned. Yes, I'm going to piggyback off my colleagues with the same response. <laughs> Excellent. Um, okay, so I know that we've, we've gone a little long tonight, so I just want to take a moment um, and thank everyone for their time and being here. Um, thank our wonderful admin admissions officers from the represented universities. Thank you to Professor Lee for the excellent historical background. Um, and also um, a shout out to Education USA, who is a fantastic partner and really a one-stop shop for any questions you may have about studying abroad in the US, whether it's on short-term exchanges or degree granting programs. Um, and if you have any questions about what you've heard here today, we have the uh, contact information for our panelists in the chat, so be sure to jot that down. But if you have any questions related to other aspects of study abroad, please reach out to Education USA. Um, we're really excited for more British students to study in the US um, and vice versa and keep that really important relationship going. Um, so thank you all so much for your time tonight. Thank you as well. Thank you everyone, take care. Bye.